Hello, everyone. Thanks for tuning in. The BMM youth team is ecstatic to bring you the seventh edition of the My American Journey series, where we interview American Marathi working professionals from a variety of different fields. On today's episode, we have Radhika Shearsagar, Anuja Sarwate, Rohan Shearsagar, Jay Puntambaker, and Avnish Sarwate, and their interesting American journeys are sure to blow you away. My name is Amol Shirodkar. I'm a sophomore engineering student at Rutgers, and thank you all for taking the time to do this interview. To start off, let's do some introductions. So let's start with Rohan. Hey, my name is Rohan Shirsagar. I went to Duke University for undergrad and Columbia for grad school. And I work as a data scientist at Airbnb in machine learning. Next up, Radhika. Hey, my name is Radhika Shirsagar. Uh, I went to University of Maryland for computer science, and I currently work as a software engineer at Vimeo. Next up, Anuja. Hi, my name is Anuja Sarwate. I went to Rutgers University, and I currently work as a software engineer at Plenty. Jay? Hey, my name is Jay Puntang Baker. Um, I studied materials engineering and economics at the University of Illinois. And currently, I'm a software engineer and CTO of my own uh, company that I've co-founded. And last but not least, Avnish. Hi, my name's Avnish Sarote. Uh, I went to Princeton for undergrad and Georgia Tech for grad school. And currently, I'm a programmer at a startup. So to start off, did you know that what you wanted to pursue or what occupation you wanted to pursue when you were in high school? This question is for everyone, and we'll start with Radhika. I did not know what I wanted to be in high school. Well, I thought I wanted to be a doctor. I was in a medical program in high school, med sci, and I ended up deciding at the end of that that I didn't want to be a doctor, but I also didn't know what I wanted to be afterwards. So I ended up deciding in college. Okay. Um, I did not really know what I wanted to do either when I was in high school. Uh, kind of, I had some ideas that I wanted to like maybe go into finance, you know, because um, that was the hot thing at the time. Uh, but yeah, really it just kind of came together once taking some classes on various things in college. Very interesting. Of niche. Um, I had no idea what I wanted to do in high school. Uh, I, it was only through kind of just like taking some classes and sampling things in college that I figured out what I would, was interested in. Anuja? Yeah, I had no idea what I wanted to do in high school. Um, I was loosely interested in like science and biology, so I kind of just picked biomedical engineering as a major and went with it. And Rohan? Likewise, I had no idea what I wanted to do. And similar to Nuja, I knew I was somewhat more math and science, um, like somewhat, somewhat more interested in math and science. Thanks for those insights. This next question is directed for Radhika. So what role, if any, did your parents play in your decision to pursue a particular subject or major or field? I ended up joining University of Maryland as an undecided engineering major, but I didn't know which major I wanted to do. I think uh, eventually I, you can only be undecided for so long. And if you want to graduate in time, you have to pick. And then I still didn't know. So then my dad was, and my mom and my brother, they all were in tech and they had convinced me to just take some computer science classes and uh, I was pretty bad at it. I almost failed my first class, but my dad was like, well, you didn't completely fail, so you can just take the next class. And I kept going with it and ended up majoring in comp sci. That's really interesting. This next question is for Anuja. So how did you um, reconcile your studies with your social life and extracurricular activities in high school? Um, so when I was in high school, I did a few extracurricular activities. I did soccer for a few falls and I would do track in the spring. And I also 
did like the newspaper and a few other clubs and I was also taking classes that had a lot of homework involved so it was difficult but I guess it was just like kind of planning ahead and you know sometimes you some things would slip but you just had to decide like you know whether you needed to study for like one test or if you had an important newspaper assignment and just kind of yeah just I guess like scheduling and time management techniques. This next question is for Radhika. So how did you plan the high school courses that you took and how useful were these courses when it came time to college? Did you get any credit for the APs that you took? Uh, luckily, I was part of a curriculum that offered AP courses um, starting freshman year. So I took the chance to take all of those and they definitely helped in a few ways. Um, and they counted as college credit once I started my majors and I would definitely recommend them if you take if you if they're available for you. Um, and worst case scenario, if the if you don't you know pass the AP, it's still okay. Um, there's no harm. And even if you don't have the courses available to you, I would recommend self studying if time permits and if that's something that you want to you know ease the burden on later on in college. Thank you for your answer, Radhika. Now let's talk a little bit about your college careers. So going down the line, what did you major in and why did you select this major? We'll start with Jay. So I majored in material science, um, specializing in biomaterials, but I also did a major, I got a, a second degree in economics at the same time. Um, and the, the reasons for that, so for material science, it seemed like a pretty uh, interesting field um, and at the same time it kind of left a lot of doors open for the future like if you wanted to do higher education you could if you wanted to maybe go into medicine you could if you wanted to go into like consulting you probably could too um, yeah so that was a reason for that uh, and then econ I just really loved the field ever since I was in high school so I kind of uh, persuaded my dad to let me stay a little longer in school so I could do that. And it was very worth it uh, in the end. That's really interesting. Next up, Rohan. So I started out, I, my declared major was biomedical engineering. And frankly, the reason I decided that was that's what the school was known to be good at. It was like ranked highly for biomedical engineering. And, and I started down that path and I quickly realized that as an undergrad I wouldn't actually be building robots that help save you know that improve healthcare anytime soon and instead I was start, I had to learn electrical engineering and mechanical engineering and so I eventually got interested in electrical engineering and then computer science and I found myself um, just sort of being attracted to software engineering eventually and I ended up majoring in that. So was your major electrical engineering or software engineering? It was, uh, sorry, yeah, my major was electrical engineering and computer science. Oh, cool. Both. Next up, Radhika. I majored in computer science and the reasoning was because I was initially engineering. I also joined engineering because I knew they had a great engineering school. I ended up doing computer science because my parents told me it's a safe decision. The job market is great. The pay is well, um, great job market. Um, and I uh, ended up, you know, just going for it. And I only started liking it um, much later into my education into computer science, but it ended up working out just fine. So that was my degree, computer science. That's good to hear. Next up, Anuja. Um, I double majored in biomedical engineering and computer science, kind of similar story to Rohan. Um, I chose biomedical engineering because I was interested in that field. I was interested in brain computer interfaces. That's what I thought I wanted to do. And in undergrad, I worked in a lot of labs. And when I worked in the labs, I realized I did not want to work in a lab. And that is when I started taking computer science classes so that I could do something that was, you know, outside of academia when I graduated. That's awesome. 
Next up, Avnish. So I majored in computer science. Um, I had vaguely thought I would uh, like to do something combining engineering and music. Um, I thought I would be like an electrical engineer and like sort of build music hardware. But then I found out that um, in my undergrad, there was a lab in the CS department that did a lot of like musical applications uh, and had like, you know, like a very inviting professor who became my mentor. So that's how I ended up joining the computer science department to work on musical stuff with her. Cool. So I know that uh, Avnish and Jay also minored in something. So tell us about what you minored in and why you selected this minor. And we'll start with Avnish. Yeah, so um, I didn't officially have a minor, but I took a lot of cross-listed computer science and music classes. So it's like, in fact, now there's more programs like this that are kind of like music technology. So I sort of scratched out a like a fake music technology minor for myself. Next up, Jay. Yeah, so... When I was in college, I um, did a program called the Technology Management Program at U of I, or University of Illinois, and pretty much it was a product of me wanting or not wanting to really pursue materials engineering in, like, in grad school, for instance. Um, and like similar to Anuja, I kind of realized I didn't want to work in a lab. Um, I wanted a desk job, so. Uh, that was one route, you know, because it would prep you to like potentially go into banking or consulting or just like working at like a big Fortune 500 in their like biz dev departments. Uh, and yeah, it was it was fantastic. It kind of like gave me an even more well-rounded education in addition to like econ and all the science classes I was taking. So totally worth it. Cool. Thanks for sharing. What was your favorite class and what made you like this class so much? We'll start with Avnish. Uh, so my favorite class was a graduate seminar I took on musical interface design. Um, what I really, the kind of structure of the class was just um, every week uh, we would have some assigned readings uh, for papers uh, and then we would just discuss them. So it was my first time being in kind of like a seminar style class. And then at the end of it, we just kind of like did a big project, sort of like building um, a custom, you know, like our own sort of like, you know, like new musical interface. And the final project was written up in the format of a conference and everyone just submitted to the conference. So it was like my first taste of sort of academia. Uh, and it was very open ended and very uh, interesting in that way. It was the first class I took like that. That wasn't just like, you know, weekly homeworks so is really just like have a discussion, think about things, build something bigger. That's really cool to hear. So this next question, question is open to everyone. Tell us about what kinds of clubs slash organizations you partake in in college and why you selected these clubs. We'll start with Radhika. Um, clubs and groups, okay. So in college, uh, I was part of the cybersecurity program I realized after two years, I didn't really enjoy it. Um, I ended up leaving that for a business program. But in terms of extracurriculars, I started off with Ultimate Frisbee because I loved playing that in gym class in high school. And then I ended up auditioning for a dance team, a Ross Garba dance team. I had no Ross Garba experience, but I ended up getting in and that ended up being quite time consuming. And I ended up not doing ultimate frisbee but i really committed to that so i did that for the first three years and then i uh just photographed those same dance competitions my senior year awesome we'll move on to jay um so i guess the, the biggest clubs or groups that i've took part in in college where one, my, my minor program that I did was really intense in terms of like, there were a lot of classes, but also a lot of things that you had to do outside of class, like visiting a bunch of like big companies. Like we went to a lot of headquarters of a lot, a lot of large companies um, in the Midwest and like met a lot of interesting people and heard a lot of people. Yeah, heard, heard interesting things um, that they had to say. Um, but I, I would say like one of the more interesting things I did was this like student-led consulting group that 
kind of simulated what an actual like professional consulting firm would look like. Um, or like kind of did these like toy projects with like local businesses on campus, but then also like with some bigger companies like Abbott and like AOL and or whatever, you know. Um, but I think like that that particular program just or group just gave me so much insight into like what the professional world would actually look like um, in like a fun way too. Um, so yeah, did a couple. Cool. We'll move on to Avnish now. Uh, so in college, uh, I my sort of main extracurricular activity was I played in a cover band. It was kind of like a student group where it was like 30 or 40 of us and we sort of like play shows all over campus sort of rotating people out. Um, I also did a lot of pickup sports and then in I joined a, like kind of school run electronic uh, music ensemble in my senior year. Can you tell us a little bit more about what an electronic music ensemble is? That sounds really interesting. Yeah, so uh, it was called, it was a laptop orchestra. Um, so Princeton's music department it was uh, it very into sort of like contemporary, like progressive types of music. Uh, and they did a lot, had a lot of history of doing like electronic music composition back from the 50s. So uh, one of the grad students, uh, in the CS department kind of started uh, kind of recruiting undergrads and just like seeing what you could do for like composing for ensembles of electronic instruments. You know, they're either using like the laptop itself or like different kind of like hardware uh, controllers like MIDI keyboards or custom controllers like that. Um, so the, you know, there was kind of weekly rehearsals. Uh, some of the graduate students in the music composition program would, you know, write for the ensemble, like you would write, write for like a string quartet or something like that. And students also had uh, chances to like come up with composition ideas uh, for the ensemble. And there'd be you know, one big concert in the spring and, you know, throughout the year, people would be working with the ensemble to kind of like, you know, do rehearsals, change up the, comp the compositions based on what works and what doesn't work like writing and debugging the software because a lot of the compositions required writing new software to do um, new electronic music things. Awesome, thanks for sharing. Next up, Rohan. I, um, I ended up trying a bunch of different things and then not sticking to a lot of them in the beginning. Like, for example, I tried a parkour club my freshman year and then I didn't continue. Um, it, it required a lot of commitment to get good enough. Um, but then um, sophomore year, I joined this entrepreneurship club slash network called uh, Duke Venture Forward. And that was um, really, I think that was pretty valuable because you met a lot of, um, you met a lot of people who, who, made, who found internships and jobs um, that were quite successful and, you know, in investment banking, consulting and, and tech and we had alumni come and from New York and the Bay Area to speak and I think ta them talking about their experiences and what they wanted in their lives helped me um, kind of similar to this helped me figure out what I wanted to do a little bit. Nice and last but not least Anuja. Um, one of the big things I was involved in in college was the Society of Women Engineers which was cool because it helped me make like the girlfriends that I maybe didn't see in class. And they, we also connected to like professionals. So it helped um, me learn kind of what the day-to-day -day was like in different engineering careers. And then I was also involved in a engineering fraternity, which was fun because we got to participate in other university things like dance marathon and cardboard canoe. So that was like a, another place that I made friends and participated in like school of engineering and like Rutgers related activities. Awesome. Thanks for sharing. So I know that Rohan and Avnish both went to graduate school. So tell us a little bit how, about how you went about applying to graduate school and your overall grad school experience. We'll start with Avnish. Yeah. So um, as I said before, I did a lot of kind of like music technology stuff in undergrad and a lot of that had a very sort of academic bent to it. Um, I knew in undergrad that I was interested in going to graduate school, but I wasn't committed to going right from undergrad. Um, the biggest thing being like a lot of the stuff that would have looked best on my application would be done in my senior year. 
and that wouldn't make it in in time for those apps in the first place. So um, I worked in a couple of software jobs for a couple of years, and then I started realizing I was like pretty dissatisfied uh, with it, and I really want to pursue music technology stuff um, more seriously. Uh, so then I, about two and a half years after graduating, I applied uh, to these places, and luckily I'd maintained uh, relationships with my advisors from undergrad. And I was like lucky enough that coming from undergrad and then in the time uh, and while I was working, I'd had a couple of uh, publications. So uh, I was able to put in like a reasonable sort of like grad school application packet because I knew that even coming out, I was like, I'm going to have to do this one day. Let me sort of make sure to keep in touch with the people who will like write my recommendations and keep working on like relevant projects. So it doesn't look like, hey, here's just this dead span and suddenly you're applying to grad school again. Thanks for the insight. Um, Rohan? Yeah, um, I, I went to grad school three years after uh, working after college. And so um, I studied computer science and undergrad. Um, and I was, you know, I was working in software engineering, but I got really interested in machine learning. And I wanted to get deeper on how that worked. And it was hard to sort of make a lot of progress on my own. Um, I made some progress, but I knew that I wanted to do grad school for that. And so once I knew what I really wanted to go deeper in and learn that, um, I was able to kind of commit to going to grad school. So, um, and so I, I studied machine learning in grad school at Columbia. And, you know, one question that comes up a lot is like, should you go to grad school right after undergrad or like spend some time in between? I think that unless you really know by junior or senior, beginning of senior year of undergrad exactly what you want to go deeper in. Um, I wouldn't say it's necessarily a, a good idea to just go into grad school as a default. Uh, it's better to get some experience and learn more of what you want before going back into it. Yeah, I definitely agree that I'm as much as I wanted to go to grad school, even in undergrad, I'm really glad that I um, just kind of like worked in industry first. So now moving on to the career aspect, what kinds of jobs slash internships led you to your current role and describe a typical day at your current job? We'll start with Radhika. Um, so for my first summer, I didn't get an internship, but instead I did research in cybersecurity at my school. Um, and the following summer I interned at Accenture and then the following summer before my senior year, I interned at JP Morgan. And I think these internships are very valuable in that it's very likely you get a, get a full-time offer from those places. Um, given that, uh, I think I wish I would have applied to more things during my internship because I didn't realize how much it could really direct your path after college. I ended up taking a full-time offer with JP Morgan and to be honest, the main reason I wanted to take it was because it was going to be in New York City and I knew just I just wanted an internship, I mean, a full time job in New York City. Um, but because I interned there, I was able to leverage that and get a position that I really wanted to, which was UI of Chase.com. And then from there, uh, I ended up interviewing um, after two or three years. And I think it's important to understand the weight of referrals. Um, I got a referral from Jay and Jay had referred me to Vimeo. He had also referred of niche and I ended up interviewing with Vimeo and getting that. So that's where I am today. Um, a typical day at my job um, at Vimeo. Well, I'm a front end leaning on engineer, which means I'm building out the UI of the video settings part of Vimeo and a typical day is having a stand up meeting at 1030 a.m. where we basically just give our status updates for the day. Uh, software engineers typically have not too many meetings. So if anything, we'll have um, just a quick sync and then the majority of my day is coding. And I like that I don't have to talk to too many stakeholders. And yeah, just building out the website, pushing code, 
and fixing bugs and socializing. Yeah. Cool. We'll move on to uh, Rohan next. So I, um, I started out working as a software engineer. And so some of the internships that I had were pretty useful for that. Um, one is I worked at a startup that was based out of Princeton. Um, and it was a very small startup. And so I was working with a few senior engineers and I got a lot of exposure in Java and um, making all kinds of sort of game time decisions. So that was great. And then I worked at Barclays uh, in New York City as a software engineer uh, my junior year summer. Then um, I worked at Bloomberg as my first full-time job, also as a software engineer. And that's where I first got exposure to this field called information extraction, which is like, how do you extract key data points from um, you know, unstructured text such as article, news articles and things like that. And that actually slowly got me into machine learning. And that's what I'm doing now. And so machine learning, maybe very generally, is like trying to automate some sort of decision making um, that, you know, it would be very hard for um, like a normal, it's, sorry, let me, let me try to rephrase that. Machine learning is trying to automate decision making for some process at the company. And in my, in my case, it's trying to automate de detecting risk on the platform. And so that's what I'm doing at Airbnb today. And so a typical, typical day might be um, querying and understanding our data, trying to uh, write a document sort of outlining our methods on what, how we want to approach the problem of detecting some sort of risk, such as like someone hacking into someone's account or creating uh, a fake listing on Airbnb. And then once that method is sort of reviewed and we sort of circulate it, it be going ahead and implementing that uh, first as a prototype and then eventually um, putting it into what we call production where um, where that actually is making decisions uh, live and so it's a lot of for me currently there's a lot more meetings uh, than there used to be and that that happens as um, as you grow in your career in certain regards and so now it's really trying to help other data scientists do that. But before it would be much fewer meetings and really focusing on the work directly. Cool. We'll move on to Jay next. Yeah, so kind of like I have a more unconventional path um, where I did a lot of different types of internships. I did like maybe five internships in college, all doing in different different companies, different areas. Um, but they all kind of led me to, I guess, first start doing work as a consultant, but then realizing that I didn't really like doing that. And that software seemed like a much more interesting field. Um, Rohan was actually one of the key people who kind of like encouraged me to to look more deeply into that as a career um and yeah um like currently i guess i have my own company that i've co-founded with a friend and the typical day is uh is pretty different from when i was working as like a normal engineer uh, i guess right now it's like very much a balance between finding time to build stuff and then uh finding ways to efficiently go through all the various meetings that I have to do with like, I don't know, uh, various people we're integrating with, like investors, lawyers, accountants, but then also spending a lot of time um, like planning the product, like doing hiring planning, um, planning what the, how we're gonna build the various features you wanna build. Um, so yeah, it's a balance between that and then having like large blocks of time to actually work on this stuff until we can hire some people to, to do that for us and like take that off my hands. Um, but yeah, yeah, that's mostly uh, a typical day is like in my life right now. You enjoy your current work more than your um, work as a software engineer at Vimeo? 
Yeah, definitely. I think it's a lot more empowering in the sense that um, I can kind of direct things how I like exactly how I want them to be. Of course, like with input from like my co-founder and like other people on my team, but like uh, there's that, and also the the like the feedback loop is a lot faster. So let's say I want to to build if I if I come up with an interesting idea, I can immediately talk to someone about it, see if it's a good idea, you know. If it's if it's good, then plan it out, build it, you know, without having to go through too many hoops, you know. So it's it's uh, it's really fun and empowering in, in that sense. Um, so yeah, I, I love it at the moment. That's awesome. Thanks for sharing. We'll move on to Anuja next. Um, so in terms of internships and stuff, the summers after my freshman and sophomore year, I worked in like labs just as an undergrad researcher, and then. The summer after my junior year, I interned at Goldman Sachs, and that also became like the full-time offer I took when I graduated. So I'd probably echo what Radhika said. It is like pretty important to put time and thought to that because my first job out of college, Goldman Sachs, it wasn't particularly exciting to me. And I think maybe I would have spent a little more time looking for an internship that was exciting since uh, it often is that your, your internship you do, you sometimes take that as a full-time job. Um, so my job currently, um, I work for an indoor farming company and my typical day, I have, you know, some blocks of time that I write code, but I'm also kind of a, like a project or tech lead for a specific project right now. So there's also a lot of working with like controls and manufacturing engineers and also working with like my product manager and my engineering manager to like figure out timelines and how many extra people we need on this project and like code reviews and stuff like that. So it's a little bit of a different role from my previous like individual contributor role. Do you prefer this current role to your previous individual contributor role? Um, in some ways I prefer it because I get to see a larger piece of the picture and I get to be involved with more things than I would have if I was just kind of writing my own code. But at the same time, it's also a lot of context switching. So sometimes it feels like it's hard to really focus and like do one thing well because you're doing a lot of things like at one time cool thank you last but not least of niche so i did a couple of pretty standard software internships um, in undergrad and then i after finishing undergrad i worked um, in a couple of sort of back-end related uh, software roles and I wasn't super thrilled with them, so I went to uh, do the master's in music technology. And that was a little bit of an interesting decision career-wise because um, I didn't really expect that to lead into a job in the field. Uh, it's, it's not like a super well-paying thing to be working in music in many capacities and the stuff I was in interested in, like particularly so. Um, so I was actually considering whether I would uh, do uh, I did end up doing a master's. I was considering whether I'd do a PhD and try to go into academia. I ended up not doing that. Um, then I worked at Vimeo. Uh, and so like kind of initially, it sort of looked like, okay, well, the, the master's was kind of like just for me. It, it was just something independent I did because I like music and had like no effect on my career. But um, while I was in grad school and just kind of doing a lot of art related things, I started doing a lot of graphics programming. Um, a little bit because I realized like there's not a lot of money in music, but there is a, a lot more money in the arts kind of doing a uh, graphics development. So I, when I started doing that on the side, I started to kind of like get little freelance gigs here and there um, and to the point where, you know, I was because I had a full time job at Vimeo, I was like turning uh, down gigs uh, to do sort of freelance graphics stuff. Um, and then eventually you know, a friend of a friend uh, had a startup that was working on uh, stuff making kind of like interactive graphics for music, which is a lot of stuff I did. And so I joined them. So it ended up being kind of exactly what led to my uh, current role, but it was a bit of a uh, winding route and not something I explicitly planned on. It's great to hear that things ended up working out for you in the end. So, all right, moving on now. Is your job related to your education? Or did you opt for a career pivot? And if so, then why? And how did you transition from one field to another? This question is for Jay. 
Yeah, so my my initial degree was in materials engineering and also in economics, nothing to do with what I'm doing at the moment. Uh, so yeah, it was not related. And uh, I went into another unrelated thing, consulting, right? Uh, so pretty much I opted for a career change because I just didn't find that satisfying. Um, I guess one in like a intellectual way, it wasn't satisfying in like a, a work-life balance way either and really wasn't too thrilled with the, the I guess the types of people and like the culture that that some of those the firms and like various companies we worked at had. Um, so I decided to transition to software and the way I did that was I guess first like Rohan gave me some interesting projects to do kind of found my feet wet decided to build a couple things myself see if I liked it then decided to really prep for this one like pretty insane boot camp in New York City, uh, which I ended up applying to and, and getting into um, and going through with it is definitely like the most grueling and painful 12 weeks of my entire life, you know, but it was definitely worth it in the end. Um, so I was able to get a pretty nice job uh, at a, at a small like ad tech startup, um, doing some pretty interesting stuff and like also working with a, a lot of really impressive people. Um, so yeah, there, there are definitely like ways that you can transition like if you so desire, especially if you're going from like, or if you have a technical background and then if you're trying to like go to tech, um, yeah. Uh, it's, I guess, a little harder if you're, for example, like an English major or like someone who's done like an arts degree. But, uh, but yeah, that's, uh, that is my experience. Cool. Thanks for sharing. Next up, what do you like best about your current job? We'll start with Rohan. Right now, what I like best about my current job is being able to uh, decide what we work on and kind of set the roadmap um, and help the team um, be able to build that out effectively. So kind of make their lives a little bit easier so that they could focus on what um, on the real work, so to speak. and. You know, when I worked at a startup, my favorite thing was actually building the stuff, um, and there's a lot more focus. And so Jay alluded to like how you can just have a lot, you ha can have a lot of freedom and go ahead and build what you want and test it out. Um, at a big company, it requires a lot more uh, what's called consensus gathering and trying to convince people of things. And so I spend a lot more time of my time now doing that, um, and then. And so that, you know, that is a trade-off that I do miss that about the startup, but it is, it's still really great to be able to help other people and mentor them uh, to, to, do, to do good work. And uh, I, I enjoy that. Cool. Next up, we'll move on to Jay. Yeah, so um, there are, yeah, I guess a lot of things that I like about my job at the moment. Um, so yeah, just to name a few, uh, I guess working as an engineer, you get a lot of flexibility, at least nowadays, in the sense of like where you work. So you can, I guess, work from your sofa or work from an office, um, which is pretty cool. Uh, I guess for my job too, like as Rohan said also, it's like it's fun to like be able to direct things and like set the roadmap. Um, so that's something I'm enjoying. Uh, it's in addition to like, being able to mentor like some of the younger people that we've hired. Um, but then also, um, I guess the thing I like most about my job at the moment is that I'm like actually building stuff still. Um, and then also building stuff in an interesting field that I like just intrinsically like. Like it would be a hobby of mine if I wasn't doing it full time. And that's pretty much what I like most. Nice. Next up, Radhika. Uh, some things that I like about my job are that I like building things. I like 
the people I work with. They're so cool. Um, I like that I'm learning something new all the time, which I didn't feel like that at my previous job. So I'm excited that, I don't know, a year and a half in, I still feel like I'm learning a lot. Um, I love the work-life balance. It allows me to have unlimited PTO um, and it allows me to do photography, which is like another passion on the side and the weekends. I feel like when my job is over, I don't have to think about my job and I can, those hours are precious. Um, and I love, I love our CEO. She's an Indian boss woman. Um, she's so cool. And it's like really amazing to have that kind of role model. Uh, yeah. Cool. Thanks for sharing. Next up, Avnish. Um, I think like similar to what Jay said in my current role, my favorite thing about my job is uh, I'm working on stuff uh, that I would, I was working on this stuff as a hobby for years and I'm getting paid to do it. So that's uh, very excellent. Um, other than that, I really am a fan of uh, remote work and my job is completely remote. Um, that and then the work-life balance is pretty reasonable. I'm at a startup, so, you know, it's a little bit less than maybe you might find at a bigger company, but, you know, still a lot better than a lot of other industries. What are some reasons why you prefer remote work over in person? Um, I'm just, I'm just more flexible in terms of kind of like either like getting errands done, like if it's like a nice day and I want to go like kind of go for a bike ride or even just like go work out in a park, uh, I can do that. Uh, if I want to sort of travel and sort of like see friends in different cities, uh, I can work while I do that. Um, yeah. Cool. Thanks for sharing. And last but not least, Anuja. Um, I would say that the thing that I like most about my current job is that there's like a very physical, tangible result of what the software does. Like we're filling tubs of kale and we're growing arugula, whereas my previous jobs, it was a bank and then it was like an e-commerce company. So you, you didn't really get to, especially as a backend engineer, you, you don't really get to see something that is happening as a result of your code. And now, you know, a conveyor moves and that's kind of that's new and exciting to me for now awesome thanks for sharing so what kinds of personal traits or technical skills would serve well for someone looking to work in software engineering of niche the stage is yours yeah um i honestly think the biggest thing is you just kind of have to you don't even have to like coding but if you do like coding you'll find a way to figure out sort of how to get good at it. Um, another thing is a lot of programming in kind of big corporate jobs is like taking human requirements and making them exact. So being able to talk to a lot of other people effectively is a very underrated part of the job. Even if you're not a manager, it just smooths out the work that you personally will have to do and kind of like everything around you if you are an effective communicator. So if I wanted to work in software engineering, what kind of degree would I need? Um, I think it is helpful to have a computer science degree, but uh, in no way is necessary. Uh, Jay, do you want to talk more about that? Yeah, um, I guess, well, let's see. What can I say on this? Uh, well, one, you definitely don't need a computer science degree, or at least that was definitely the case maybe four or five years ago. Um, I think as the years go on, the market for junior engineers kind of gets more and more saturated with people moving into the space. So I actually think it might be a bit harder these days to transition the way I did. Um, but what I would say is that uh, any anyone who's kind of willing or enjoys any type of technical work, whether that's, I don't know, I, whether that's like engineering or, or something else, like we'll have it, I guess, easier time both learning engineering, but then also getting a job. As some examples of people I, who are in the, the bootcamp program I, I went to, like there was a guy who was a linguistics major, there was a guy who was a actor, guy who was a trumpet player, but then also a lot of people who came from engineering 
like chemical engineering, bioengineering, uh, like molecular genetics, you know, um, and even some people who used to work uh, in like investment banking. You know, there's there's actually even a professor, uh, former professor from Juilliard who was in the program with us. Um, so yeah, just literally anyone who's kind of technically oriented and down to learn, you know, uh, I think is uh, what you need, not necessarily a degree. I would also even add that uh, if you are in a computer science degree, there is a difference between computer science and software engineering. Like to, at a high level, like a lot of what my computer science degree entailed was just a lot of like math and a lot of very theoretical stuff that I found it really interesting, but it was just not in any way related to the type of stuff um, I did on the job. So even if you are, so like, it's more important to like under, to sort of like build things and really get hands on and play with stuff and like actually write code than to like learn all the technical math uh, stuff you'd learn in a CS degree. Uh, that does change if you're starting to get, you know, into like much more like specific roles then people will want you to know like the theoretical underpinnings of what you're doing. But if you're kind of just starting out in sort of like a general programming role, um, it's not the most urgent thing to know. Yeah, what, what I'll add also is that like while you don't necessarily need a degree, it's, it, has, it is very helpful to have one. Agreed. Um, it like, yeah, definitely makes you look like a much more attractive candidate to like some of the top tech companies. Um, and then I guess I would say probably leads to an easier time progressing up, up the ranks too. Um, especially if you want to be like an IC or go into like a specialized field, like what Rohan's done, for example. Yeah. Um, yeah. If you start to specialize just having, and this is like for the very small pe percentage of people who want to really go down these like very technical routes, like having uh, just a general math background is very helpful for learning lots of like more academically oriented things. If you really want to kind of like research industry hybrid job or like things like that. I don't know, Rohan, you could speak more to that, I guess. Yeah, so just to touch on the software engineering thing, I think also every school kind of has like a personal character to it. So Princeton's very theory oriented. I have some friends at, who went to Waterloo and it was like very software engineering oriented. Like all a lot of the classes made you better as a software engineer. So that might be something to kind of research and look into depending on what you're interested in. Um, I'm currently working as a data scientist at Airbnb and the people that are in, like my peers, they, a lot of them, you know, a lot of them did PhDs in, in something like, but it, not necessarily computer science. It could be in physics and statistics um, and all kinds of technical fields. So um, there's a lot of different paths, but most paths involve coding along the way and being technical and um, yeah and then for for something like AI or machine learning um, yeah I think more classes and, and, and degrees in that field is generally helpful thank you for the insight guys um, I know Rohan you mentioned that there's multiple paths that you can work in within this field so what is the general job outlook for this uh, for the technology field generally. We'll start with uh, Rohan. I think that it, the general job outlook for tech is very strong. Like I think, you know, when we were, when I was entering college, it used to be like, I think Jay mentioned like finance or consulting. Those were the two big areas of, of jobs that people wanted to work in and that were hot, so to speak. And now tech is like, is huge and it actually suits many different personalities right? because there's people who are really good at implementing code really quickly others are better at coordinating different people and so there's like technical program managers and product managers um, and uh, you know and, and then product yeah and then there's like managers just engineering managers who are better at they're better people people so um, there's lots of different sorry people persons <laughs> there's lots of different um, there's lots of different roles in tech that could suit um, your your interests and in, in the way you work. So I think the job outlook is very strong. Oh, Nish, do you have anything to weigh in for this question? 
Um, yeah, I think the, another thing I would just kind of like uh, toss in is just like anecdotally, I've been hearing like similar to what Jay said that it is becoming more competitive for new grads to enter the space. I think just because now it's like, it is the sort of general narrative is like, oh, it's like really hot to be in tech right now. Just like a ton of people are moving into it all at the same time. Cool. Thanks for the insights. So Anuja, I know that you're a current job interviewer and Jay, I know that you're a current hiring manager. So what kinds of qualities do you look for in software engineering candidates? We'll start with Anuja. Um, I would say beyond like a basic ability to code, mostly like communication and collaboration ability. So like if we work through a problem, how effective are you at, you know, saying what you're thinking through or what you're working on and how good are you at incorporating hints or suggestions and, you know, uh, just how easy are you to work with? Because that's kind of, I think, in my opinion, a big predictor of if you'll work well in a team and on a team and if you can effectively deliver what you're asked to do when it involves working with like people outside yourself. Jay? Um, yeah, I was thinking, thinking about this for, for a little bit, but I, th I think like, especially at like a, a young, small company, the, the two biggest things would be like one, can you actually build stuff like, like beginning to end? Um, and two, like how much like ownership can you have and like take on like how kind of senior are you um at like smaller companies it's like way more difficult to find time to to train like junior like younger developers so those are pretty much the two two big things um but a, a couple of other items would be like your your general interest in like side projects but then also in my field so like web3 crypto is um just how much do you really know about the space and how much passion do you have about the space do you understand like the like the philosophy behind it you know or are you just here for like other reasons cool thank you for sharing <clears throat> so moving on do you think a glass ceiling exists for the first generation and if yes do you think it exists for your generation? The first generation, meaning like our parents, like the immigrant generation. This question is for Anuja. Um, I don't know how, since I'm not in the parents' generation, uh, I don't know if I can speak to the what their experience was. I'm sure that there was some amount of limitations because maybe the, the space was more homogenous when they joined. Um, I would say for our generation, for women, you should definitely be vigilant about checking the salaries at your company because pay and equity is definitely, you know, a pretty common thing. So um, yeah, it's not like it happens everywhere, but it's just something that you should always be asking about and not, not assume that, um, you know, things are totally equal. You know, people say that it is easier to get into tech than a lot of fields. And this is like generally true, but there's still a lot of the same kind of, you know, like like in-group, out-group dynamics, you know, like people like with, uh, you know, uh, like rich schools will, or like, you know, the uh, like fancy schools, like a lot of companies will only go to recruiting the, these places. So that kind of like a little bit of the sort of like elitism and distribution stuff is like still there. It's not, it is, I think a lot better than a lot of other industries, but it's definitely not like kind of like everything's like shiny and rosy yet. So yeah, it should kind of just like keep your eyes out for, a lot of the normal ways that you might be screwed over because you don't want to get caught by surprise. Thanks for that insight. Mm -hmm. How do you figure out how to balance work and life in your role? Um, so I've always had like pretty strong hobbies with kind of like mus music and art stuff and sports. Um, and even in school, I'd kind of start noticing I was just like not happy a lot if I, it's like it's been like a long time since I played some soccer, if I like hadn't been making music recently. So it's even in school is when I got kind of tuned into that. Um, and then once I started a job, it became like kind of like very apparent that like a core part of your job is you're trading your time for money. And so if you start to, you know, if over a long time, you know, you'll start to feel it when you feel like you're not getting your uh, your time's worth uh, in it. So if you really start to like feel like you, 
you're giving up too much of your time. That's some something to think about in terms of whether you're getting out enough money or enough like job satisfaction. So just kind of pay attention. They kind of people talk about like mindfulness, kind of just like keep an eye on your mood. Uh, and because I've found really that this sort of like lack of free time in your day or like lack of breathing room over the course of like a week or a month is something really important to um, be aware of as to like how to uh, specifically like advocate for your own work-life balance. That's kind of a deeper question about like how you communicate with your team, whether you want to keep your job or how you decide whether to change jobs or not. But like at a high level, I'd say, yeah, just kind of like keep an eye on your mood and how squashed you feel emotionally and remember that like time is the one thing you can't ever get back. That's a great point. Jay, do you have anything to add on this? I mean, if there's anything I could add, it would just be that uh, software is a great industry where you can experiment with different levels of what Nisha is talking about. You know, and that's definitely not the case with a lot of others, you know. Um, and yeah, lots of different companies have different expectations and routines that their teams have. Um, and then also, when you're an engineer too, you're, you can kind of decide on the path you want, like what Rohan mentioned earlier too, which is like, he didn't want to be a manager because he doesn't want to, he had that particular trade-off of like time and work, it's like, just, or what is it, time for satisfaction? You know, it's just not what he wants, you know, whereas if you are an IC, like, you can kind of shape your own schedule and, yeah, kind of direct uh, what ratio you want. So. What does IC stand for? Uh, individual contributor. So it's pretty much like a senior, or the, the, you kind of go into two tracks as an engineer. It's like either management route or kind of more IC or like individual contributor route where you're just becoming like more and more of it, like a technical leader you know, like designing stuff, mentoring people, uh, like just, I guess, advising various people, uh, leading, I guess, different uh, implementation initiatives. I, I don't know. They, yeah, you're pretty much like, just like a, a super engineer is <laughs> one way to describe it. Cool, thank you for those insights. Anuja, do you have something to say on this question too? Um, on the question of work-life balance? Yes. Yeah, I would probably advise, um, you know, for a software engineer, the amount of work-life balance you have, it kind of depends on the company and the industry because you can be a software engineer at uh, maybe a bank where there is an expectation of longer hours, or you can be a software engineer at a company where all the engineers are um, people like you who value their lives outside of work so probably i would suggest just like in the first five or so years of your career like hopping around jobs until you find that you know goldilocks amount of work that you want to do for the pay that you also want to have thank you for the advice to end off thank you all so much for the amazing insights i know your advice definitely resonate with me personally and many of the viewers as well but if you could go back in time and tell your younger self, your younger 15 year old self one piece of advice, what would it be? We'll start with Radhika. Um, I, oh, okay, 16. If I could tell my 16 year old self some advice, I think I would tell her to um, be a little bit more bold and confident in herself. I think I felt very easily intimidated um, in many things, like such as applying to colleges or applying to jobs, because I felt like everyone around me, I could physically see everyone around me in that same pool and I would constantly compare myself to them and I would end up, you know, feeling like I would end up doubting myself a lot more. Um, I think I noticed when I was interviewing like, you know, after college, I didn't, I wasn't physically seeing these people, but I felt a lot more confident. Um, so I think if I had that confidence early on, I could have, you know, 
been in a different place, but uh, I'd say it all works itself out. And I would also uh, um, say like anything that makes your heart skip, like any kind of passion that you find yourself uh, like getting engrossed in, like definitely go all in to that as much as you can and uh, just do what makes you happy if, if you find it um, and hold on to it. That's a great message. Thank you so much for sharing. Next up, Jay. Um, if I was to tell my 16 year old self something, I would say, uh, do your homework. Um, and then also like the, the returns to working hard early on are way greater than the returns to working hard later on. Yeah. Do you mind elaborating on that a little bit? I think like setting yourself like a good foundation early on saves you a lot of having to like prove yourself later down the line um, and like opportunities kind of just emerge easier um, like early I would say um, and things just compound you know is, is what I've kind of noticed cool thanks for sharing next up of niche yeah mine is kind of similar to Jay's um, that uh, like not all time is created equal. There'll be times where like, it's really worth it to just kind of like push through for like, you know, I mean, like the, like whether it's like finals week or like, you know, someone has like an opportunity for you to do some project you want and it's like worth it. So, you know, uh, when you see a, like a kind of lucky opportunity, really take the effort to not um, kind of drop those because those are the types of things you can't plan for. So really capitalize them when they happen. Um, and the other thing would be to just kind of like, you know, don't necessarily worry about the future a lot, but kind of keep it in the back of your mind. Um, it's useful to have a long run view on things when you're trying to figure out the present. That's great advice. Thank you. Next up, Rohan. Um, so in terms of being confident, I agree with what Riley just said, but how do you build confidence? Um, I think maybe do more projects that interest you and can level up your confidence. So just find little projects that you're comfortable taking on that don't feel too scary. Uh, and so I wish I told myself that and I did more of that. I'm still working on that. Um, and then the other thing is try to find people that you vibe with and you know give you good energy and really um, really reflect on who those people are and and go spend more time with them. Interesting. And last but not least, Anuja. Yeah, I think I would echo what Rohan and Radhika said is find things that interest you, find people that interest you and just kind of remember that your career path and everything, it's not going to be linear. So not to at a like a big picture level, don't stress up, stress out about it too much. Just like work hard and keep your eyes peeled for, you know, things that might excite you or interest you, even if it's not what you originally had planned for your career. Thanks for the advice. Thank you so much to everyone for taking the time to do this interview.